Hey everybody, uh, hopefully I am live and everybody can hear me okay. So tonight, copyright. So we're gonna be like talking all about copyright and I know a lot about it, right? And for those of you who are, you know, in the Art of the, the, Art of the Song pitch, we talk a lot about it. And uh, okay, I see Cheryl's coming on here. Um, but as I was saying, uh, definitely looking for an expert, right? And I wanted to bring on a true expert at this and Cheryl has litigated tons and tons of copyright uh, issues through the years. She's been a lawyer for a long, long time uh, in the entertainment business, has done a, amazing things. And uh, hey, Cheryl, if you're there, I see your, your photo. Uh, just make sure your camera and your mic is on. So the top, at the very top, make sure those two buttons are, are clicked on. The blue, they'll turn blue when they're on. They should be above uh, sort of my picture, I think, on your computer there. Boom. Hello. There, I can hear you. Perfect. I don't know why it makes me go through all of this over and over again. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's a little weird, but you know the cool thing about this platform is once you master it and you get everything going, it it actually works really, really, really well. So, isn't that true? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> nice. So, what is it ten thousand hours to get good at something? Who yeah, I know. I know. Hopefully not. Not with this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Uh, just looking here. They, okay, looks there. Everyone's good. So, can everybody hear us? Everybody, I assume everyone can hear us just fine. Cheryl, thank you so much for doing this. This is fantastic. I was just telling them about your, you know, amazing sort of history and litigation and all of that. And uh, you know, one of my favorite stories to sort of introduce you, and you tell it best, is the uh, the Kingsman case. I love that that uh, story. One of the many that you've you've sort of been through. But uh, it's one of my favorites. So if you don't mind, uh, so I don't get anything wrong here with the with the story, the nuances here. Well, looking back, I can say it's one of my favorites. At the time I was in it, I'm not so sure it was uh, one of my favorite experiences. <laughs> right. I kind of regretted it most of the time <laughs> <laughs> that I was in it because it went on for four years yeah. of my life. Um, but uh, the Kingsman, for those of you who are too young to remember, which may be many of you, um, was one of the landmark recordings of the key of Louis Louis back in the early 60s and what makes the story so great is the song was recorded for $38 in a recording studio in Portland Oregon and paid for by the father of the group one of the members of the group who were all like 16 years old and weren't old enough to even tour or make any legal decisions for themselves and the the record was sort of turned it was nothing um, and basically kind of, they were signed to a guy named, G I think it was Jerry Dinan up in Seattle who had some little label. And then he cut a deal with a woman named Florence Greenberg who had a, a, a label called Scepter Wand back in the day. And Scepter Wand was distributed by CBS, which is now Sony. Um, and CBS, they had uh, groups called Gene Pitney, the Shirelles. They were actually some pretty big groups on the label. But uh, the... The story of why Louie Louie became famous was the fact that um, one of the some college kid came home from school and at the holidays and had the the record and was playing it in their room, and supposedly the parents heard it and thought the lyrics were dirty. So somehow or other, they reported this to the authorities, and it ended up on the AP wires. This is a true story. And the group was ended up being investigated by the FBI. So, of course, then suddenly a record that was nothing was suddenly being played by every radio station in the country. And that is a true story. But fast forward 30 years later, they had never been paid of one royalty. And uh, I took the case like a, you know, kind of thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to go save the world. And uh, it turned into be that we were suing some very big crooks who had bought a, a warehouse that had 50,000 masters in it and uh, weren't paying royalties to anybody. And the Kingsmen were in a case with, had been left out of the case that had gone all the way up to the court, Federal Court of Appeals that involved Gene, Pitney, the Shirelles, and all the other artists on the label. But instead of suing for money, we sued to get the masters back. And I'm happy to say that despite all the pain and agony we went through, Judge Keller, downtown Los Angeles in federal court, ultimately ruled in our favor. And it made history because no one had ever rescinded a recording agreement 
and gotten back the asset, which ended up being much more valuable than the royalties because the royalties in the contract were like two pennies or something, right, for each record sold because it was so old. <laughs> And um, so now the Kingsmen own the masters and uh, I get a small percentage in payment, but it will never pay me for the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of time and effort I put into that case. <laughs> but I learned a lot and I'm happy to say that, you know, it helped a lot of other people be able to recover their masters when they don't get paid or their songs. So that's a whole other topic we can discuss at another time. Well, Cheryl, it sounds like you, you, in essence, made history. I mean, because you, you, this must be a reference point that's brought up in other cases then, if this was... Well, yes, and I actually, there's a lawyer in downtown, uh, a lawyer named Neville Johnson, who I respect very much. He's a very wonderful, fine attorney, and he's done some miraculous, wonderful cases over the years, much more so than me. But I remember when I first kind of met him about 10 or 15 years ago, He's the first and only person that's ever said that to me, and it may, was so greatly appreciated. He said, you have no idea what an impact that case had and how much I've used it in my own practice to help other artists. So oh, amazing. that made me, that was just nice to have that validation from somebody. That is so, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, so anyway, you know, segueing from that uh, into thanking you again for coming on here for our community, the Sync Songwriter community. There's so many songwriters out there who don't really know uh, about copyright, you know, and or the, just the basics. They don't understand how to protect their music. They don't understand how copyright impacts what they make they, and, and all of these questions that I'm dying to ask you. Um, and of course, we'll have a QA and a at the end and all of you can, can ask Cheryl your questions as well. So. First thing, Cheryl, I'm, I always like to know this of anybody that I interview is like when you were first starting out, like in maybe maybe it wasn't music, but when you first were getting going, what got you into music law? What were the two? Like, how did you end up in both of those things together? Oh, yeah. Well, OK, well, we'll bring I'll try to make it brief. But it was um, I had the idea I'd worked for a woman in my senior year in high school for the big do dollar an hour, if you guys can believe that, 20 hours a week. And that was how I was going to fund my college education. But I was so determined to go to college. And she, she, legal, she was equivalent of a paralegal, but knew was very knowledgeable. She did uh, in the real estate field and published a legal newsletter for lawyers in real estate. But and I helped her gather the data for that newsletter every week. Mm -hmm. But she sat me down and I had never thought of being a lawyer. I really didn't know what a lawyer was or what they did, but she planted the seed in my head. And then I was went off to college because I was planning to be in the medical field. I was going to be a nurse or medical tech, medical technologist. And then I found out I had to be in lab 20 hours a week. And I went, uh, -uh I'm not doing this. So um, I discovered the very first night I went to college, there was something called the coffee house, National Coffee House Circuit then. And there was a concert for the opening weekend. And there was like 1,500 students crammed in this ballroom. And I don't remember who was playing. But all I remembered was I was so struck with the whole experience. I went, I have to know who does this. How do I participate? So I ended up, um, by the time I was a senior, I was running, helping run this the student booking program. And we were in a small town but we had a big budget for entertainment. So we produced concerts and films and dances and lectures the entire school year. And I ended up hosting a conference on my college campus for about 40 colleges from three states. And it was a showcase for live talent. And there was about 20 artists that came and showcased to be booked into those colleges. And I became friends with one of the agencies who somehow a year and then could convince me that I should give up going to law school in Louisiana and go become a talent agency in Denver, Colorado. And I did that. And I had the opportunity to work with such unknown people as Steve Martin, Jimmy Buffett, who had not even gotten off the ground yet. Wow. But, and um, so it was quite an experience. Jimmy Buffett was, uh, I was taking him to college booking conferences as a college rep, and uh, I remember my. He was just uh, 
he was a traveling troubadour. And yeah, at that point, he was trying to get started. I don't yeah. even think he had a record deal, but I remember he got up on stage at a campus in the Bible Belt in Texas and saying, why don't we get drunk and screw? <laughs> and the, the audience <laughs> looked at him like, who are you? So uh, that's he went a, Jimmy, a long way from there. That's an unknown Jimmy Buffett story. And, wow. uh, and then, um, you know, we, we, our main group at that time was a group called the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band because just a oh, bit yeah. of quick bit of music history. Nashville at that point was the Grand Ole Opry and it was country music. It was Minnie Pearl and Lester Flat and, you know, the Grand Ole Opry. There was no such thing as pop country. And so that was why this little agency was flourishing because the partners had the really brilliant idea of trying to pull together what was considered avant-garde at that time outside the mainstream of Nashville music, um, which was still country music, but at, not as we know it today. And the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band was a great example of that. They were probably an early example of pop country rock. And, uh, and then um, there was like, we had a, what I call acid bluegrass band called the New Grass Revival. It was some fabulous talent. You know, and it was a great, and Earl Scruggs, who up until that time had only played acoustically when electric, which was considered right. sacrilege in Nashville. And right. he went on. So tour. how did you, it, how did sorry, I, I, I just, this is really cool. Like this, uh, the whole history of, 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 you know, Nashville and you being around that and stuff. But I'm really curious, like, how did you, like, when you're going through the, how did you get in, like, you went to law school and then you decided, boom, music. No, I, I was, only went to law was school to be a music lawyer. All of this. I only went to okay. law school to be a music lawyer. That was it. Okay. And I, in Got fact, it. I worked for the agency full time the first year and I went to law school at night at the University of Denver. Wow. Did you, like, uh, you know, you know so much about copyright. Did you specialize in copyright or is this just one of the many facets? No, it's of every, things it was you, the number one thing I had to learn if I was going to be a music lawyer. Right. Was, was copyright. Okay. So, you know, I was mostly self study and then, and took a course in it. But yeah. I learned by all the lawsuits I did and all the record deals I've done and all the publishing contracts I've negotiated. And, right. The, you know, so it, it's, I guess it's you learn by, trial by fire as the saying goes you know it's hey. like a musician any of you who are musicians you, go uh, you know and compose and study with other people right okay so so let's let's start like at the very basics like for maybe somebody's on here and they really don't know what copyright is at all and so you know what essentially is song copyright just in a nutshell and how does it affect songwriters, you know, just at a basic Well, uh, it's a great question because it's the fundamental question. It's the, it's the key to the entire business. Got um, it. The okay. music business, whether it's a record company, a publishing company, uh, their songs themselves, yeah. everything about the music industry in terms of getting paid is tied to a copyright. That's it, Unless, other than live performance, okay? Live performance is uh, is something different but um everything from radio airplay to having your music used in um, public performance on the radio or um streaming now which is popular everything all of those sources of revenue depend upon the copyright uh, and the copyright is something that's guaranteed by the constitution not the word copyright but just a little bit of technical stuff, but it's not something anyone really learns in school much, so it's good to know about it. Article yep. 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution guarantees the rights, or it says that Congress shall uh, make laws to guarantee uh, protection for the rights of inventors, which would be patents, as well as authors to secure their writings. So, uh, you know, uh, composing a song or recording a record is a form of authorship. Okay. And so, yeah. Okay. And well, then there, there are six, and we, we can go into those, but there are six, five or six sticks in the bundle of rights. So a copyright is, think of it as six pencils with a ribbon tied around it, and each one represents a different legal right that belongs to whoever owns and controls the copyright. 
Oh, and quickly, what are those six? Okay, well, when it comes to the song, I'll start with the song because the master is a little bit different. The song copyright involves the right to uh, reproduce the song in copies, which would be to put them on a record or to make sheet music because that's a reproduction or copy of the song, the lyrics and the notes and the mu music. Um, then there is the performance right, which is to publicly perform it. That also includes to have the song performed on radio. Um, it's also to have it performed on the internet or streaming. Yep. Um, then there is the right to, uh, to mechanically reproduce the song in um, phono records, which we, that's a copy, but that's a considered a man mechanical reproduction. Then there is the right to use the song in relationship to visual images, which is a synchronization license. And then there's the right to prepare derivative works, which would be to make an arrangement to have it, you know, a, a new version of the song. Excellent. And those are the rights. Then there's a second copyright, which is the copyright for the sound recording. And that's mm -hmm. important for people to understand. It's fundamental. Because I think oftentimes one of the biggest mistakes I see young composers make or writers, they think, oh, I just need to join BMI and I'm protected or ASCAP or CSAC. Um, but it's important to know that each of those legal rights that I just mentioned are usually licensed and controlled by somebody different. So, uh, and I can, if we have time more, we want to get into that, I can. But so, you know, it's important to know what rights, how do you collect the different amounts of money and or where the different revenue streams are, and we'll get into that. Okay, excellent. And so that actually segues into my next question. What is the best way to protect your music? Obviously, as you said, not just signing up with a PRO, a performance rights organization like BMI or ASCAP. So what, what is the recommended legal way to, to Well, do there's, the, you have to distinguish between, first of all, let me, signing up with ASCAP and BMI or CSAC is a wonderful thing to do. And if your music is out being used, then you need to do that. But it's, that is not in any way protect your music. It has nothing to do with protection. It is only a collection, a means of helping collect your money, your money. But as far as protecting the music, you've got to have a copyright through the U.S. Copyright Office. And we, I think you and I, we talked about this in an earlier call we did a couple months ago, mm -hmm. which is do not, I do not know where it came from. You can erase it from your consciousness. Do not repeat it. Do not even think it has any validity. You cannot mail a copy of something to yourself and have any protection whatsoever. <laughs> Instead, you go on the website called copyright.gov and you fill out a form and it costs $30 and it's very simple. Anyone can do it and you can upload your music or, or you can send it in by mail and it's a $30 fee and you can do an entire collection of songs at once for $30. So, so you, you can do uh, your whole catalog? catalog at once. Wow. Okay. So guilty as charged. When I was in a band, I had these parcels I kept in my top closet. I mailed them to myself, my <laughs> demos and stuff like that. So, you know. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Cheryl, for clearing me up on that. Oh, 15 yes. years too late, but hey. <laughs> right. But anyway, so, you know, it's it's a simple process and it's something it's true to realize if you're creative and you think they don't know much about business, get over it. You have to learn the basics. Right. And you know, these are, I mean, yeah, these are really basics, aren't they? I mean, yeah, they're fundamental it, to your business. Yeah. yeah you know, musicians know? don't need to be lawyers. All they have to do is understand this. You just these have basics. to do, you have to understand the business part of it. You know, I mean, you're in a business and Yes, you hope you will find somebody who will help you make you make you a celebrity or help you record, have somebody famous record your songs or get your songs out there. But guess what? In the end, it's your career and you have to take responsibility and personal accountability for knowing enough to not get screwed. Can we be blunt? <laughs> you <laughs> Love know? it. Love that. Yeah. And, uh, no, it's so, so true. Well, so Cheryl, this is kind of something that's gone sort of back and forth and I've done some reading on it and and you and I briefly chatted about that, and it's a little bit of a mystery. Um, but, uh, you know, the impression I get about music being stolen or ripped off or, you know, those cases where they end up in court, like the Led Zeppelin thing that just happened, you know, here in L.A., 
Um, I, I understand from, you know, I can tell from what I can read and from what I can tell is that it's fairly rare. Now, it's, I know it's impossible to know, and you often hear songs on the radio that have, you know, like, wait a minute, that, you know, feels like it was lifted from this song, or, but it's, you know, not an obvious sort of plagiarism. Um, but would you say, and I know it's difficult just to, to tell, would you say that, that musicians shouldn't worry, like, get paranoid, essentially, about people ripping their music off uh, if they put it out somewhere? Um, well, I think you have to distinguish or not. well there 's two different areas to be concerned about, and I think one is much more rare than the other okay um, the ones people hear about the the sexy cases that are in the news right that make the headlines, like the Led Zeppelins or you know the case with Pharrell Williams or whatever um, but those are very rare cases, and number one. Those are questions of whether another composer or songwriter infringed by getting too close to the music or lyrics, right? In other words, and mm -hmm. I don't think those, especially the Pharrell Williams case, I mean, those, that was a case where it was like, it's not a question of whether or not somebody intentionally went out and stole it. It's more a question of, is the song too close to somebody else's? Does it right. sound too much alike it? Are the notes too close? That sort of thing. That's one area, and I think those cases are very rare, mainly because they're hard to prove. And, you know, I don't think people go out and consciously decide to steal somebody's words and music. It's, if it happens, it's more of an unconscious copying, okay? okay? The bigger concern, which I think does happen, and is the reason for getting your songs copyrighted. And I think it happens a lot, especially with the internet. Songs that are popular in particular, who have some success, they get, they get stolen all the time in bits and pieces. They may be used in somebody, on somebody's website. They may be used, they're just not, people don't get, go get a license. The bigger risk is that music is being used without paying for it. It's right. not that it's being stolen, the words and music are being stolen, it's that the actual song is being used and not paid for. Yeah, and that's the bigger risk. That's the way. much bigger issue. Okay. And I think that's what is going on a lot on the internet. And it's very hard to police that all the time. Um, you know, you can catch some of it. And again, I mean, that's, that's what the entire, the whole entire issue of, you know, people, you know, what publishers go through on a day to day basis, the big publishers, you know, all these uh, TV shows that get put up overnight, you know, on YouTube or, or albums come out and then the next day the entire album is up or that minute within hours, the, the entire album is up for download on YouTube. Yeah. And, well, that's, that's how musicians are getting ripped off. That's why the royalties are, have been so low because people are downloading music for free. That's the stealing right there. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's and you, the theft. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, well, you've magically segued into my next question again. Okay, I love, uh, so, I love anticipating your yeah, next I, I, question. I, I, yeah, it's like, uh, so, so how does copyright uh, then affect a song income? Like how are those two tied together? Well, it's not so much to, well, number one, let me back up and say this, and I hate to even say this because it's so misleading and it gives people a false sense of security. The copyright statute says that the copyright vests in the author from the moment of creation, that you have a copyright without doing anything, okay? So, and that's true, you do, but it doesn't mean much. So what's it worth, you know what I mean? And this is why, because all of the legal remedies that are provided for in the copyright statute mm -hmm. are tied to someone who has a registration. Okay, there's one exception. If I have the copyright, let's say I've written a best-selling song and I've never filed that $30 form to register it in the copyright office, and you come along and you, you to put my song in a commercial and the commercial generates multi-millions of dollars worth of income for your product, okay? Mm -hmm. And I have not registered the song. I can sue you and I have a valid copyright, but guess what? I have to prove and you can spend years in court fighting over to prove what your profits were. 
So you get to spend right. hours, months, and hundreds of thousands of dollars to not let me prove that you made any profit. You're going to say, well, I spent it all in advertising. I spent it all in marketing. And this is the bigger issue. The profits I made had nothing to do with your song. It had to do with the product. So that's an enormous burden, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, what if it's not a big fancy commercial? What if it's somebody uses it on their website or somebody puts it on their record or somebody uses it where it doesn't generate hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it could have paid you a license fee of a thousand or fifteen hundred or five thousand or ten thousand, right? You have a small chance in hell of collecting any money. And here's why. Because if you do have the registration, unlike the example I just gave you, you have additional remedies. There's something called what's called statutory damages. Sometimes people call it in lieu, in meaning I-N-L-I-E-U, in lieu of proving damages, the way I explained in the case about the commercial. Mm -hmm. An in lieu damage or statutory damage says if you have a registration prior to the date the infringement commences, then I can make an election to get a statutory amount without proving how much you profit you made. Okay. okay. So, so <clears throat> I can I can take an aggressive position. Let's say somebody had that happen and they come to me as a lawyer. The first question I ask them is, do you have a registration? If I can contact those people and write them a cease and desist letter and say, we have a registration. And if you don't enter into a license fee and pay us 5000 or 10000 or 3000 or whatever it is, we're, and we have to sue you, we're going to not only sue you, we're going to get our attorney's fees. And that is the other big remedy that you get with a registration. It protects your right to get attorney's fees from someone you have to sue for infringement. And that is a BFD. Because the cost <laughs> yeah. of going yeah. to court, and I cannot emphasize that, yeah. it costs hundreds of, it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring a copyright case to trial. I mean, wow. to the point that it's almost not worth doing. So that's why from a legal lawyer standpoint, I've had to turn down the vast majority of people who have had infringements because I would go broke trying to win their case. Right. Because right? yeah. there's no way for me to get paid. Right. So so now now this registration, what is can you just clarify what that registration is? Exactly. Well, there's two. There's the one we talked about with the song, and that is usually on a PA form, Performing Arts, right. but then there's one for the sound recording, and I, I didn't quite complete the description of the second copyright. The second copyright covers only the recorded performance, and that's the master. So right. it's separate and distinct. So if, let's say, you record a Beatles song, you own the master recording of that, your performance of that Beatles song, but the publishing on the song or the is still owned by the Beatles, right? Right. You know, Lennon McCartney or whoever it was that record, wrote the song. So, but if you record your own song, then you have two copyrights. You have the copyright, which is the words and the music, and then you also have a copyright on the recording. And that copyright has become much more important and valuable nowadays than it used to be because of the internet and streaming. And where it shows up that's really vital to know about is, is, and this is a weird, and it's getting technical, but it's really foundational to, to understanding the business of the music, the music business itself, as far as getting paid. So it's an important point, I think, for me to make for your, for your listeners. Um, the, if I, a song, Remember I went through the six rights and I said there's a performance right. That's only for the song. Okay? On in regular terrestrial music for TV, uh, radio, live performance at nightclubs, venues, restaurants, all of that gets paid as a performance right on the song. The master does not have that right. The master has a reproduction protection. It was originally granted back in the 70s to protect owners of the master 
from piracy. That was when there was a lot of pirated CDs and stuff like that. We didn't even have digital downloads yet. It was all pirated right. CDs. So that was the that was the way Congress amended the Copyright Act to protect the owners of masters from their masters being ripped off. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But in addition, when they created the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has to do with everything on the internet, it was a very it's a very out of date statute and doesn't work very well. But one of the things they did do is they granted a performance right in the sound recording, but only for internet. Okay. And that was for internet radio. So this is the weird dichotomy. So now if your record is streamed on a streaming platform, the owner of mass gets a bonus income if it's streamed on the internet, but they don't get a performance right. But then the owner of the song that you've recorded does not get a performance right when it's streamed on the internet because they don't have a performance right for internet and the reason why is because everybody from like uh, Sirius FM all of those people with big deep pockets lobbied against the songwriters getting paid right right it's always the songwriters that take the short end of the stick mm -hmm. when it comes to getting paid yeah well they, they have the least so, power to fight it so <clears throat> right but that's why well, it's going to get better because of that new statute, which I think we've talked a little bit about, the new um, Copyright Act, that the new statute is going to oh, yeah. effect. But so hopefully the incomes will start to go up from the Internet uses. But uh, So that's why it's important. And by the way, I should mention that if you were the owner of the master and the owner of the song, you can get both of them protected on the same form. So you don't have to file two different copyrights to protect them both. Okay, so so now just in a in a pragmatic sort of practical way, as a songwriter who's interested in making sure that they sort of cover all their bases, they're going to want to register with the copyright office, make sure that they have the registration, yes, which they can get. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they're going to want to make sure that uh, well, that's basically it. If especially if they're the writer and they own the master, so yes. if they they write the song and then they record it. They've got both both sides of the copyright. Exactly. Okay. That's it. Okay. Cool. Fairly simple. Then you just have to go out and be famous, or get your <laughs> song music used, and collect yeah. your money. Right. Nice. <laughs> and by the way, you don't have to be famous to make a lot of money as a songwriter. Right. I mean, you can be totally unknown and do really well as a songwriter, oh. especially in film and TV, if you if you're able to connect in that field in a big way. Well, that's pretty much what we do. So I as know. a songwriter, that's, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. So, um, so how do you, uh, you know, you, you touched on it. In fact, you more than touched on it, but how does streaming and, uh, you know, licensing royalties work in terms of, you know, when things are streaming on the internet these days? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's very complicated. In fact, part of address... getting, yeah, too crazy with it. You know. Yeah, well, right. Well, also, I, I will get into that. We'll remind everybody, but there's a free download that I worked pretty hard on for everybody. And it's yeah. the Songwriter's Guide to Getting Paid. It's a two or three page handout. And it's not legal. It just tells you who collects what royalty, yeah. type of royalty, and then explains a little bit about some of the copyright rights we've talked about. Um, so there's different as we've already discussed, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, they take one stick out of the bundle. So if you're a member of ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, you can't be a member of all three. You've got to be a member mm -hmm. of one of the three. They collect only one of the sticks in the bundle on the song side only. They collect the performance right. So they collect money from radio stations. They collect money from um, nightclubs restaurants who perform music, even retail clothing stores may only pay a couple hundred dollars a year, but they get a license because they're publicly performing music. All of that money goes into a, and uh, TV stations pay big, huge, multi-million dollar fees. Those monies go into the kitty at ASCAP, BMI and CSAC respectively. And then they, each society has an allocation system where they divide that money amongst their members based on whose music is used the most. Okay, so um, that's basically how that one particular right is handled. 
Um, Got it. Yeah. yeah. Then All there's, right. yeah. I was just going to say, um, so Cheryl, thanks for mentioning your download. I was going to do that towards the end. I decided, since you referenced it, just to publish it. So everybody, if you look on the, I believe it's on the right side of your screen, you should see a little download link. That's where, where you can go get Cheryl's uh, awesome guide for, you know, basic. Yeah, and it's very basic. Stuff. It's intended to just get give you the nomenclature or the name what to yeah. get you familiar. And, you know, there's a lot of greater detail we could go into, but that's a starting place. So I hope it helps everybody. That's so great. Thanks for doing that. That's amazing.